by everyone's estimation, Tiger Woods is one of the great players of all time and belongs on the Mount Rushmore of golfing history. And the pervasive argument that still persists is, is he, in fact, the greatest to have ever picked up the sticks? And as of the numbers right now, Jack Nicholas still does have 18 major championships, but Tiger has 15, including the one this year at the 2019 Masters. And that is certainly a consideration. Jack does have more, but it's my position that Tigers were made during an era that was far more competitive and had much more competition for him that were pressing against him that were by golfers that were more fit, more teen, um, were using uh, better nutrition and had just a, a much more in the way of obstacles against him to win these major championships. And then on top of that, Tiger did have 108 pro wins across the world, 81 being on the PGA Tour, which is only one behind Sam Snead. And again, Sam Snead played in an era during the 40s and 50s when it was difficult to travel overseas. And for a lot of these wins, you know, men were uh, you know, fighting in wars and the best players uh, were not able to play on these golf courses. So if you put apples to apples, I think the real conclusion that any rational person can come to is that Tiger did, does indeed have the finest golfing accomplishments of anyone in the sport. So if we look at his top five major championships by strokes clear of the field, it's very clear that you have five majors, all between 1997 and 2006, that were phenomenal performances, the minimum winning margin being five strokes, which for a major championship and with the difficulty that they structure these major championships, a lot of times trying to tiger-proof the course, it's that much more testament to his dominance during that 10-year stretch and even to today playing so well in his 40s. So starting off at number five, you have the 2005 U.S. Championship, U.S. Open Championship, or otherwise known as um, the Open or British Open. And this one was wire to wire. Tiger was quick out of the gates. And it was against Colin Montgomery, who finished second. And the interesting thing about Colin is that although he was number one in Europe for seven or eight years, he never did win a major on the US PGA Tour, although he did come very close and has since won three on the senior tour. And what comes to mind about Colin is that in 1997, he was paired with Tiger in the second round. And when he was asked by the media, they said, how will you fare against Tiger? And he said, well, I've been here several times more than Tiger has. And then at the end of the round, he came in deflated, dejected and said, you know, Tiger is going to win this tournament and not barely, but convincingly so. So it's just funny to see the switch of emotions as people began to fully realize the greatness that was to come with Tiger's performances starting at the Masters. And this actually, the 2005 U.S. Open or British Open was his second career Grand Slam uh, at the whole at the uh, the old course of St Andrews, and he was 29. So he was rounding out some of the greatest play that uh, the golf world has ever seen. And the number four is the 2006 PGA Championship, where he also won by five at Medina. And the rough at Medina there in Illinois is some of the longest. Now you talk about rough for a U.S. Open and then rough for a U.S. Open at Medina. And it is just brutal. They were putting yardsticks or you know rulers in the rough on the telecast to show how deep the rough, in fact, was, even if you strayed just a few yards from the fairway. And it was the longest at the time in major championship history because people were trying to tiger-proof these courses because just like Augusta was structured, the way that he would attack a golf course, he gets a favorable bounce or 
just if he the ball goes where he aims it, it will go and get that amount of roll that he intends. And going into par fives with short irons or at times wedges is just dismantling a course and is playing it essentially by the brute force strength and having an unfair advantage over the rest of the field by coming at pins and cutting off dog legs and attacking a course in just the way that Tiger can. And at this point in time, he was 12-0 and when leading or tied for the lead for 50 ho 54 holes. So that represents a dominance of being able to close you know, unlike anyone in the sport. And when it comes to golf, all golfers know how easy it is for things to slip through your fingers and for one hole to completely dismantle your confidence and make things fall apart as you feel the intensity of the cameras, the lights, the commentators that are watching your every shot and that are waiting to nitpick at when things start to go and unravel on you. So on this particular occasion, he tied his own record that he had at the PGA Championship at 2000 at 18 under par, which is just an unbelievable number to hit at a major championship, no less. And then number three is the 2000 U.S. Open or the British Open Championship. And at this particular time in 2000, he was youngest to hit the Grand Slam by two years. So, you know, being 24 years of age, it's just remarkable to be able to achieve your greatness and have it sustained over a long period of time, so much so that you can achieve the career Grand Slam. And the 19 under that he hit at this British Open stood for 15 years until Jason Day bested up just by one, hitting 20 under. But for a course where getting into a bunker means that triple bogey, even by the best players of the world, is entirely possible. Because if you hit a bunker the wrong way, it's not a matter of skill. If you're plugged, as David Duvall went to show at the one of the British Opens that he won, you're going to have to hit it sideways. You're going to have to unplug the lie or take an unplayable because it's so buried in there that you're going to be half to aiming backwards. And it's it's part luck, but also part skill in that Tiger would play a lot of these British Opens without hitting a single bunker or pothole bunker or any of the major obstacles that came the way of just about everyone else in the field. And this British Open was particularly notable because it was the first to broadcast in high definition. And the advent of television really did help Tiger. His own effect of the popularity of him and him being broadcast across the sporting world and the rest of the world by virtue of the $40 million Nike contract that he signed where they used him as the cornerstone for their advertising and him being on Wheaties boxes and generating the interest on television and the deals that were able to be signed that infused the purses of these events was the Tiger effect. And so many players are able to benefit from that. You hear stories about during Jack Nicklaus's era, you know, Gary Player and Arnold Palmer had to, you know, fly themselves and would just make enough money to pay for themselves and their caddies and families to travel with them. And now it's a whole different ball game. And when Arnold won the British Open, he flew over there and was just able to make his own expenses. And it was more an issue of do, how much do I love the game and how much do I love being an ambassador for the game. And because of Tiger's compounding interest that he was able to generate, you know, players are not even top players, but like top 100 players are able to take net jets and fly around the world in comfort and bring their wives and kids and families and friends and just have the time of their lives and go across the world without experiencing too much in the way of jet lag by virtue of being able to charter an entire plane or at least share a net jet with a bunch of their friends and make it a crazy positive experience so that they're able to bring their best to the golf course. So coming in second is the 1997 Masters that was so instrumental in bringing Tiger on the world stage and that brought 
so much attention to him such that 44 million viewers were watching on Sunday give or him give a hug to Earl Woods and show that not only was he here as a young man, that he was living up to the potential that irked so many other players by virtue of the Nike contracts that he was signing and all of the excitement that was coming as a result of his three junior amateur wins and then three U.S. amateur wins and then winning NCAA college, collegiate championships and just demonstrating the dominance that would hallmark his career for the next you know decade or two. So you had the controversy with Fuzzy Zeller and you had the cold reception of many of the past winners that were kind of unsure about Tiger as a proven commodity that were in many eyes of the players taking away from their proven abilities to win these major tournaments. So Tiger started out, even though he's played the course before as an amateur several times, he started out as four over on the front nine holes and him and Nick Fowler played poorly to start out. But from his account and many accounts, he was able to reset after that nine holes and produce some of the most brilliant golf by someone that's just entered their 20s that we've ever seen. So this was an extraordinary performance that had him win by 12 and was a performance only eclipsed by the number one 2000 U S open where he rocketed to victory by winning at 12 under and, or win by a margin of 12 strokes. And it wasn't like he was entirely free from problems. The course was so brutal with the rough that on the third round, you know, on the third hole, he got so embedded in the grass that he couldn't see the ball. You know, Steve, you recounted that he looked down there and no white was visible, but they knew roughly where it was and he had to take a swipe at it and he just got it a few feet forward. So he did grapple with a triple bogey there. And then on 18, he was playing one of the greatest rounds ever, and he snap hooked one into the water. And with the final ball, Steve Williams' caddy gave him a ball and he roped it down the middle. So he himself said that this represented the four best rounds he's ever put together, and the score certainly reflects that. And, you know, we all know about all the extraordinary shots, but all of the short game shots that put his ability to get up and down from the deep rough from where you'd have to take your medicine and chip out is really the unsung hero his ability to grind on those par to make those pars was really tremendous and what sticks out with a lot of people too is being able to muscle out and get on in two no matter where he was you know on that par 5 where he was below the green by quite a bit and in the rough and he would still go for the green because he knew that if he caught a flower out of the rough that it would roll up nicely especially if the green was above where he was and his ability to pull off that shot as the commentators were so right to comment that this represents a shot that not even a majority of the field can pull off so the performance that he exhibited in the 2000 U.S. Open was nothing short of spectacular that in order to pull superlatives by the commentators, they had to pull from other sports. You know, even now they look back on it and say it was a Michael Phelps type of Sydney Olympics type performance. It was a performance that transcended the sport and just represents the brilliance and dominance that Tiger brings to the golfing world as who many believe to be the greatest golfer of all time.